Ooh. Good morning. And now before anybody, I know people have asked that sometime between when I went to bed last night and when I woke up this morning, my knee decided it doesn't want to work right. The current theory most propagated is Joan kicked me. But I have, I have no evidence to support that, but we're going to worship together anyway. And I'll tell you what, it's a whole different experience with a choir and stereo. You just got to sit and enjoy it. But it's good to see you this morning and come and gather and worship the Lord together. And I'll point you in your bulletin for some announcements. This evening we've got our children's music and missions at 645 and adult Bible study as well at the same time. And that's going to be in, I think it's labeled Classroom 3. It's the first classroom around the corner there on the left. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we've got deacon meeting, children's meeting, and choir. Something every night of the week for you there. You can find something. Come join the choir or help with the kids or whatever. Down at the bottom, you'll see a couple things. Remember, if you're a part of the flower committee, Roberta wants to talk with you real quick after the service. Notes about business meeting coming up and vacation Bible school. And you can see there's some information about a children's book contest. Two different age groups from 5 to 7 and 8 to 12. There'll be some more information coming on that, but that's going to run from June 19th through July 31st. And I think somebody's going to come talk about VBS signups, maybe. Good morning, everyone. So Vacation Bible School will be here before we know it, um, June the 12th through the 16th. So there should be these in your pews. Um, I want to kind of explain a little bit about what each thing is. We So it's Sunday through Thursday night. We serve dinner at 545 every night, a child-friendly dinner. Um, and then VBS starts from 6.30 to 8.30 every night. Um, we need at least 20, is that what we said? Um, a minimum of 20, and that's with anticipating about 75 children. Um, we have averaged 50 to 60 kids in the last couple of years, even, even with COVID, and, and before that it was a little bit more, so we're praying that, that we're on the upper end of that. So definitely at least 20, up to 20 to 25. Um, we know that it can be a, a big commitment for every night. If there's someone that's able to volunteer every night, we would absolutely love that. If you say, I can only be here Tuesday and Thursday, we'll take it. Um, because sometimes we end up piecing together, you know, whatever we can get for a couple of nights and switching things around. So any volunteers, any time that you can come, we can find somewhere for you. Just a couple of different things if you think about, you know, what you feel comfortable doing. Um, if you... Jump down to group leader. All I need is you to be here and be able to keep track of the kids. Just make sure they don't leave your group. They, you don't have to teach, you don't have to study, you don't have to, to do any preparation time ahead of that. You just come here and you chase children from one place to the other. That's all I need you to do. Um, then I do have, we do have the Bible lesson teachers um, you could do every night or if you wanted to only have a couple of different nights, uh, we could do that. Crafts time, we all have that prepared for you. We just come in and you help facilitate along with the group leaders. And then mission teachers is kind of same, a um, little less preparation time maybe than the Bible lesson teacher. So each group will kind of rotate around to your session. Um, then we always have um, sweets and things that would go with the dinner. So if you want to donate any of that, that would be great. Um, we'll take those or you can put those in the kitchen. So um, you can fill these out and just put them, where do we want to put them? You can put them on the front pew up here. Or you can find Jessica or myself and give it to one of us. We, I will be downstairs this morning. But um, you can fill it out or come find us if you have any questions. We appreciate all your support and be in prayer for a successful VBS this year. Here we go. All right, let's say a prayer together as we begin. Father, what a blessing it is to gather in your house, to come together and worship. And we ask this morning as we consider these things that you would turn our hearts towards faith in Christ above all else. 
these things we pray in that name of Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing this morning. Hymn number 405, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Next hymn this morning is number 204, Rock of Ages. So we pray together this morning. I think you can go ahead and start remembering VBS and as a prayer that um, children would come, that they'd hear the gospel, and it would affect their lives. And it's a good opportunity for that. And um, we'll pray for that beginning now and kind of looking forward to that event. 
We're going to say um, a moment of praise. You know, um, we prayed for Marie Powell and some of the things she was going through. And um, if you catch up with her today, she's greatly improved. But she'll tell you that um, there are segments of time where she doesn't remember. And, and she saw coming back up out of it how deeply she had fallen in, into that. And so I want to say a word of praise that the Lord... Um, chose to let us keep Marie for a little longer, and we're excited about that. And I want to tell you about Nathan and Tessa Baker, and they are missionaries in Madagascar, and there's 20 or more more languages and dialects there, and um, what they've done, these missionaries and other missionaries that have been there with them, they've translated Bible stories into these local dialects. And they have arranged for this 20-minute radio program. And they air these Bible stories on the radio in the local dialect, the local language. And don't you know, there was like this worldwide pandemic. I don't know if you've heard about it. And uh, everyone was stuck at home with nothing to do. And you know what they did? They turned their radio on and they listened to some Bible stories. It's just the craziest thing. You just never know what might happen. And so many listeners have responded and asking about salvation or discipleship. Uh, One story they tell us about is there's a witch doctor who called and said he wanted to be delivered from evil spirits. And so there you go. There's some things. We'll pray for Nathan and Tessa. Let's go to the Lord together. Father, thank you for your goodness to us each day. There are many different praises we could give for the blessings you give us and the greatest of which being salvation in Christ, but flowing on down. We thank you for Marie improving and hopefully being able to go home this week. We thank you for your missionaries in, um, in Africa and the influence that they're able to have in people's lives and taking something like COVID that is so terrible in many ways, but you're able to twist that and see good come in the midst of it, like people being able to hear Bible stories on the radio. We ask you continue to help them in this that ministry there. We also pray for our vacation Bible school, and you begin to um, put it on the hearts of parents and children to want to come, and that we would have a programs filled out with volunteers that children could come and hear the gospel and understand what it means to find hope and joy in King Jesus. And all of these things we pray in that name. Amen.
Well, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to focus a little bit more on God's Word, a little less on my knee. How about that? Well, this morning as we continue into Genesis, we, we meet Noah for the first time. And you've probably heard stories along the way. Noah built the ark, and we'll cover that next week. We also have one of these long genealogies we run into and takes up the vast majority of chapter 5. And for our purposes this morning, I'm trying to, I don't want to just skip over it because it's still God's word. But I also, if I take a week to cover every chunk of that, we'll, we'll be here clear through the middle of summer. And so trying to, so I encourage you to read through it again and look, there's a couple of different little Easter eggs of kind of things in there we'll, I'll point out as we go through that might go, oh, well, what's that all about? But we're focusing on this morning this idea of finding a way out of frustration and grief of sin. And we're going to look at Noah's father's frustration with the curse of sin and see the Lord's grief over the spread of sin on the earth. But in the middle of it all, that there's a way out. So read with me Genesis chapter 5. Verse 1 through chapter 6, verse 8. It's going to be a little bit long, but you hang with me and we'll make it. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And the days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years, and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahal. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahal 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahal had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalo lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalo were 895 years, and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Chapter 5, verse 24, this is the one to wake up on if you've dozed off. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Just tuck that one away in the back of your head for a moment, and we'll come back to it. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Side note. Different Lamech from last week. Digging the genealogies, we see it's a different, different guy. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground the Lord has cursed. This one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Headed into chapter 6. Almost there. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw the daughters of man were attractive. And they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. 
The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Pray with me. Fathers, we open up your word together this morning. Ask that you would speak to us through your spirit, that we would understand what we need to see from this passage and apply it to our lives today. So the things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You probably notice this passage kind of starts back at creation. We've got this short recap, almost like the author is saying, okay, we've gone through chapters one and four, we've seen these things talked about Cain and Abel. Now we're going to kind of leave some of those things behind, but I want you to catch what's going on. And we've got creation and we go Adam and Eve and we go to Seth. We see some of this longevity of life. We mentioned last week, Adam living 930 years and following this particular line to Noah and seeing each generation, there are other sons and daughters. Don't know how many, don't know who they are kind of not the point, but what we can kind of see is as you go generation by generation and how quickly they would multiply out across the earth. Every generation having more sons and daughters and they having more sons and daughters. And nine generations after Adam, we come to Lamech being the father of Noah. As I noted before, it's a different Lamech than descendant of Cain. And it's one of the benefits of having this genealogy is we can have that clarification But he gives birth to the son, calls his name Noah, and says, Out of the ground the Lord cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. There in verse 29. I'm going to pause there for a second and resonate a little bit with what Lamech said. And he knows everything we've studied before, all these stories and what's come with Adam and Eve. It's nine generations later. I did the math but a little over a thousand years. But with how long people are living, Adam's only been dead for about a hundred years. And Seth is still alive within 10 years of dying or just past within the last 10 years, I forget. But the memories and the understanding lives on. And it's been just as frustrating as they thought it would be back in Genesis 3. That's the first point this morning. Sin leads us to frustration. Lamech is kind of tired of dealing with it, looking for relief, and kind of hoping that maybe something could be done about this. He says, maybe, maybe Noah will be the one that something can happen with here. Maybe Noah will be the one to help save us from this difficulty we're dealing with. What Lamech does that I want to focus on a little bit, Lamech does correct, is... He looks all the way back to the root issue of sin. And he's noticing that, okay, sin entered the world. The Lord cursed the the world. Going back to that, the Lord cursed the earth. The sin issue hasn't gone away. There's got to be a way out. But he's looking back and recognizing that the effects of sin, the things that he's dealing with, are rooted all the way back to sin entering the world. I don't have to tell you that the effects of sin still frustrate us today. In fact, the Lord was kind in that, and he gave me a great object illustration in my right knee. Now, I'm not saying that I sinned, and therefore the Lord, like, hurt my knee. That's not what we're saying. But we're saying we live in a broken world, and there are things like pain, and we have things where our bodies don't function the way they should, and it's this categorical part of being in a broken world. We look forward to one day when all things are made new and there's no pain and no suffering. And in the meantime, sometimes we go to bed and everything's fine and we wake up the next morning and we can barely walk. And we just take that one step at a time. We can see that frustration. You you can turn the news on for five minutes and see corruption and evil and, and Ukraine and just, you don't have to look very far and see this, this frustration with sin in the world. The reason why I want to dig into that a little bit is because we want to see that Lamech has correctly identified sin as the root issue. 
So we have to understand the root issue so we can understand the solution. If we think the real issue is poor leadership, then we just look for new leaders. If we think the real issue that our plants have thorns is that we, the soil is bad, we're gonna go looking for new soil. And I'm just gonna, just spoiler alert, you can buy any soil you want from Lowe's, but it's still gonna grow up with thorns and weeds and stuff. It doesn't, there's nothing you can do with it. And you know that. And if you think the real issue is that we need to put forth more effort, then we'll keep putting forth more and more effort to try to make things right, and you never get anywhere. You just wear yourself out. And so Lamech looks at this painful toil of his hands, the struggle living in this life, and he recognizes there's something about it that's connected back to when the Lord cursed the earth. There's a connection back to sin. And recognizing that if something is going to be done, something has to address this issue of sin. Well, sin leads to frustration. But number two this morning as we move on into chapter six, sin grieves the Lord. Now I'm just going to tell you, there's some really strange content there at the beginning of chapter six that will make you go, what? You know, this stuff about the sons of God having children with the daughters of men, and there's giants that um, call the Nephilim and ESV, and their offspring being mighty men. And uh, we, we talked about that briefly at the Bible study last week, and we can hit it more tonight if you want to. Different theories about, well, if people are living 930 years, that maybe they're growing more. Um, different theories about, well, maybe... Um, daughters of man and sons of God is referencing humans and angels and some kind of interaction. The point for this morning we're going to look at, regardless of those exact details, was the Lord looks down at this situation and says, this, we can't deal with this. This isn't right. We can't. See, seeing the impact of sin spread, and the Lord says, look, I've had just about enough of, uh, of this living to 900 and some odd years thing. And the Lord says there in verse 3, Look, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. So it's one of the immediate responses of the Lord. Look, you, y'all, y'all living to 900 years old, you got way too much time on your hands. We're going to cap that at 120. You, that's, that's enough. You, got, you can have that, and then it's time to move on. Seemingly, maybe the longer they lived, the more corrupt they became. And, and so as we go into verse 5, that's one aspect of what it means when, when it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord looks at sin in the earth, and he sees these things and what's going on. He sees nothing but evil, and he sees mankind that was created to be worshipers created to be in the Garden of Eden, worshiping their God, becoming instead multiplying evil across the earth. And not just a little bit, but everywhere, everywhere he looks, because that's part of the effect of sin in the world. And it reminds me of this phrase I heard, there was this, um, this kind of rap artist, is, went by the name Propaganda, so I gotta give him credit, but he did this spoken word thing where he explained the gospel. And if you look it up, just look up propaganda, gospel, it's, it's kind of cool. But what he talks about is the, the effect of sin and how it spreads out. And the phrase that he used was, even your good acts are an extension of your selfishness. And it's capturing this idea where the Lord's looking and seeing there's nothing but evil here. Everything is evil. Everybody in their hearts, they're just, they're just producing evil. And that's the idea that he captured there, that, that as sin spreads, it affects us in a way that our natural inclination is away from the Lord. And that our sinfulness runs so deep that it affects even our motivations to do good things. And without God changing our hearts, even our best actions have some kind of sin-tainted root. And again, the issue here is sin, and the Lord looks at it and says, something must be done. So we arrive in verse 6. We're not surprised to see the Lord says that he regretted that he had made man on the earth. Regret, it doesn't mean that the Lord was surprised by what happened. He knew what happened, was going to happen. 
Of course, the Lord, God's all knowing. He knew this would be the outcome. God knew this would be the outcome of creation when humans were made and went in the Garden of Eden. I was talking to someone this morning and he pointed out, people look and say, why would God allow sin to, to be on the earth? And said, well, you have to recognize it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. That's, God didn't put sin in the earth. We messed up. We started it. And the alternative, God could look at that and say, okay, um, y- y'all messed up. So we're, we're just going to destroy everything and start from scratch. Or we can let this play out. And I'll give you an, a way to find restoration. So indeed, God planned our salvation from the very beginning. And it says in Ephesians 1 that God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. But as we look at verse 6, there's a second aspect you may not have noticed. And that's although the Lord desires a better way, he desires us to turn from sin, there is love that he holds for us that makes him grieve over sin in the world. Look in the last half of verse 6. It says, it grieved him to his heart. I want to take a moment and... I want to recognize and realize that there's something about the character of the Lord that when he sees sin on the earth, he's just, the wages of sin is death, there's justice, but his love mixes with that in a way that he looks at the brokenness and it grieves him. Like his, kind of like if you're, um, you let your kid learn how to ride a bike. It's the right thing to do for them to learn how to ride their bike. And inevitably, what do they do? At some point, they fall off, they skin their knee. And it grieves you, right? Like you, you, you hold sorrow in your heart for your kids scraping their knee because you love them. But you also look at that and say, all right, now get up and do it again. <laughs> right? I'm like, That's the right thing to do. So there's, a, there's an aspect of God's heart where he's grieved by the negative effects of sin. This captured in Ezekiel 33:11, And the Lord says in that passage, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. So the Lord's looking down on the sinfulness of the earth and he regrets the situation existing, but he pronounces judgment because there's justice of the Lord, but also love of the Lord. But he looks and he's saying, I don't delight in that. That the fact that punishment is necessary, the fact that the world is broken, the fact that it's not the way it was originally intended, grieves the heart of the Lord. This is the idea behind Second Peter 3.9. Peter talks about the wait for revelation coming. And he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. In other words, when the Lord delays the events of revelation coming true, it's not because he's slow about it. It's not because he forgot. It's because he's looking around going, ah, oh, but if I wait a little bit longer, then this person will come to repentance. If I wait a little bit longer, this person will come to repentance. If I wait a little bit longer, then we, can, we have more people that will find faith in Christ. That's the heart of the Lord towards our brokenness and our sinfulness of saying grieves him. This is the heart of the Lord described in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And then here in Genesis, when we have this idea about it grieved the Lord, grieved him to his heart, it's beginning to capture the idea of what that means. There's a book written by Dane Ortland. It's called Gentle and Lowly that explores this deeper and looks at that passage and other things. That I think it's called um, The Heart of the Lord Towards Sinners and Sufferers. So if you're interested in reading more, I actually have two copies of the book. They're sitting right there on the table. And just like shameless plug, if you want it, pick it up on the way out. First come, first serve. But this is the heart of the Lord grieved by sin. 
the heart of the Lord that desires a life for us unhindered by the effects of sin. The heart of the Lord that cares so deeply for us that he would take our place in death. We see the heart of the Lord moving forward. We see it here, this grief. We see it forward into the Gospels when Christ came to the earth and lived a perfect life and died and rose again that we might find eternal life. Not because he had to, but because his heart towards us is one of love and care. Because his heart towards us is grieved by our suffering. And this is the same heart of the Lord that wants to prepare a place for us in eternity. Sin leads us to frustration. Sin grieves the Lord. Of course, as I mentioned before, the Lord's justice in proper judgment still comes. And he doesn't desire anyone to perish, but he's still holy. And that sin still separates us from God. And so indeed, a price must be paid. And here in verse 7, we see that he pronounces his judgment that's coming. And so we end up with this just terribly bleak picture. Because on one hand, you've got Lamech looking around going, I'm tired of the painful toil of my hands. I'm tired of this effect of sin. I don't want to deal with it. Noah maybe can do something about it. And you have the Lord looking around going, the world is just falling apart and full of evil and it's not, this isn't working and we got to do something different. (laughs) And the solution there in part is this judgment coming with the flood. Because the Lord's still holy and sin is still a real issue. It must be dealt with. And here it comes. But then we arrive in verse 8. In verse 8, it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so that's number three this morning. There is a way out. Of course, the first question when you see that statement and seeing the full expanse of sin and seeing the judgments on the way and Ah, but here's this sinful guy who somehow found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And so the question then is what? Is how did he do it? Why did he find favor in the eyes of the Lord? While we're at it, we can look back a little bit. You remember we looked at, at Enoch. Enoch had said, walked with God and then was not, for God took him. What was it about Enoch that was different? What was it about Noah that was different? But then we can even go back further and revisit Cain and Abel in our minds real quick and say, what was it that was different about Abel that his sacrifice was accepted, but Cain's wasn't? So in the midst of Cain's jealousy, Abel's offering was pleasing to the Lord and accepted. In the midst of all the madness going on in the earth, Enoch's taken up to heaven before death. As evil continues to multiply in the middle of all that, you've got Noah that finds favor in the eyes of God. How'd they do it? What was different? And the short answer is they had faith in how they lived their life reflected their faith in God. Their faith affected their lives and their relationships. In the midst of everything else going on, they looked to God and said, okay, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to pay attention to you, be obedient to you. Now, you might look at this passage and say, okay, Brian, but it says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, and it doesn't say all those things you just said. Ah, I'm glad you asked. Because there's, we have this benefit from our side of history. We can look back and see what other people have written in Scripture and help us gain this understanding. And actually, I'm going to... Uh, I meant to tell the guys in the back, I'm headed into Hebrews 11 uh, through 12, if you could get that ready. There's this long passage in the book of Hebrews that gives us some insight and actually specifically addresses the the situations of Abel, Enoch, and Noah. We'll be in Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 4. You want to read on the screen. It says, By faith... Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. 
Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God concerning events yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So we can look at that passage in Hebrews and say, okay, appreciate that insight and look back and see that what was different about Noah, the way Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord was by his faith. The author continues on and tells of the faith of others like Abraham and Jacob and Moses and that goes all the way through the end of chapter 11. And going into chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, The author of Hebrews makes this connection to our lives from the other side of the Gospels. See, for these people, for Noah, he's looking and saying, okay, I'm going to trust the Lord, but I don't know what the end game is. Lamech is saying, I'm tired of the painful toil. I know something's got to be done about sin. Maybe it's Noah. When we come, Hebrews 12, chapter 1, sorry, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such, so by so great a cloud of witnesses. A cloud of witnesses is pointing back to the faith in chapter 11. So because we see in the faith of Abel and Enoch and Noah, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was before him endured the cross despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And what it's saying there is that we're also called to have faith like those people listed in chapter 11 of Hebrews. And that we can look back and see the faith of Noah and see there's something there to emulate. But as we've talked about, Lamech is looking for Noah to be the one to fix the problem. And from our side of the cross, we can look back and say, ah, no, Noah had just as much issues as we did. He wasn't the solution. Christ was the solution. We trace through Genesis. That's why we have this genealogy that traces through all the way down to Noah. We flip over to Matthew, and you can look, and you can follow this genealogy, keep going all the way down through Abraham, through David, all the way down to Jesus continually looking for what's the solution sin frustrates me what do I do about it I'm tired of living in a broken world what do we do about it and getting here and pointing to say ah Jesus is the solution and we can look to Noah's faith and say ah I want faith like that but also look to how they tried to find the solution in Noah and say no it wasn't Noah Jesus is the answer And so our faith in God is directed towards Jesus as our Savior. We lay aside the weight of sin. We turn from our rebellion. We turn to God in repentance, follow Christ as our Lord. As it says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So sin leads us to frustration can't wait to go see a doctor about my knee. Tired of living in a broken world. I'm going to get a couple amens for that one. But our sin, the sin in the world grieves the Lord. He's not to leave us in our brokenness. There is a way out. And his name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pray with me. Father, thank you for this good news. Thank you, we can look back and we can see we are not alone in our frustration over sin in the world. We're not alone in our brokenness. But Father, thank you that you can point us and say that you care about us deeply to be grieved by the struggle, but you care so deeply that Christ would come and suffer and die and rise again that we might find new life. Do you remind us of this truth Help us to point one another and others to this hope and joy that comes only in Jesus. Amen.
We're going to stand and sing hymn number 330, Only Trust Him. Stand and sing. to worship with you this morning. I'm going to say uh, goodbye to people on the way out from this door this morning. So I won't be in the back, but people leave out this door too, and they should get a handshake and a hug, right? And plus the neat thing. But it's good to be with you this morning. Blessings as you go. Choir is going to sing our benediction. <laughs>